Hello again and welcome to part two of this long lecture about macro developments, macro in time and space of our little world. In the first part I gave you an introduction and I gave examples or indicators of the Western decline and coming fall. And I indicated that I think what is happening, what we are seeing, but the West is in denial about, is the rise of the East, China and Asia, with the Schwerpunkt, the central dynamics being the Belt and Road Initiative for the BRI, uh, which is the world's largest cooperative project involving at the moment about 80 countries. Now, I'm going now to going to, of course, part three, four and five. And the first one has to do with the question you are now, I think, asking, but how is this gigantic change going to happen? What happens when an empire falls and somebody else is rising and, you know, everything we've taken for granted will be changed? There will be lots of problems. And that's why I ended by saying in the first part that there will be some very difficult years ahead. And then hope, hope, hope. And I believe it, otherwise I wouldn't sit here. There will also be a much better world on the other side of the crisis. Remember the Chinese idea that crisis consists of two signs. Uh, one is danger or problems, whatever you translate it with. The other one is opportunity. Every crisis is an opportunity to get on, learn something about ourselves and the others and get on. Now, will it happen with a bang or with a whimper? Will it happen differently from the way the Soviet Union broke down under Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, whom I consider one of the greatest statesmen in modern times, namely by peaceful means? not blowing up the world when you know that you have basically lost the game. We don't know, there is no Gorbachev in the Western world, and certainly not in the United States. We don't know whether somebody will one day sit in the White House and say, game is over, let's blow it up. I mean, the question I've raised sometimes with no similarity uh, among persons, uh, with personalities, but with the situation, would Hitler have used nuclear weapons from his bunker if he had had that button and those weapons in that bunker in Berlin? It could also be that we see a slow decline and somebody saying, okay, we seem to be losing this game in the West. We've had our time. Let's get the best out of it and cooperate with the new world instead of confrontation with it having confrontation with it and threatening it with wars and economic warfare and all that. The West has enormous capacity for adaptation, flexible ways of doing things, if it could get its acts together and get a long-range vision, which it doesn't have. At the moment, everything is crisis management. It's an American president who thinks one thing in the morning and one thing around, a different thing around lunchtime, and a sad thing when he writes a tweet uh, in the night. You can't run the world by that method. It's an indicator itself that it's over. So there will be fractioning internally too. As the United States is going down, NATO will naturally fraction, fall apart, fragment. It's already clear there's a huge conflict about who's going to pay the bill with this stupid idea that military expenditures should cover, should be equal to 2% of the gross national product. Have you heard anything that stupid? If the economy is going well, then we should have more military. I was naive enough to believe that military should be shaped according to what kind of threats and challenges we see uh, in the immediate and longer term future. But somebody's now trying to tie it to to economic development. So if you're going down, you can reduce the military. If you're going up economically, you can, you can increase it. You must increase it. I mean, this is simply so intellectually lousy. 
uh, that I'm surprised that so many media, politicians, and nature itself takes this kind of garbage seriously. But, you know, few people think that much. They hear something and then, oh, that's the way it is. By the way, when it comes to fake, fake is not the most important thing in this world. Omission is much worse. What you don't hear, what you're not told, the perspectives you don't get, the experts you don't hear, the events you don't get any information about through the media and in the political discussion. So, NATO is also a, uh, an alliance that has a great past but no future for the simple reason that it has not delivered what it promised. You know, it has a mantra. The mantra is, we create stability, security, and peace. Now, excuse me, where is that now after, what is it, 70 years? What we have instead is warfare. We have a new Cold War in Europe where those of us who are old enough remember what a fantastic situation it was that the wall came down and we had no more Cold War. And we have constant threats. And we have a Turkey that is falling out and now cooperating more with the alleged enemy, Russia. We have the US, the leader of the alliance, going, you know, I don't know where it's going, but it's not going anywhere that's worth following. And so NATO will fall when the US empire falls. I am not saying the United States and the Republic will fall. I'm saying the empire will fall and militarism will fall. It has to fall. It cannot be sustained much longer. Next, the European Union. First of all, the European Union has never lived up to its own treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, namely that those countries belonging to the EU should have speak with one voice in foreign and security policy matters. Every of these countries are still nationalists. They go to war, they do this and that. They don't even consult each other anymore whether they do this or that. One of the very few instances where NATO, where, sorry, where the European Union had a, a, a unified one voice policy was when it recognized Slovenia and Croatia out of Yugoslavia. That was the single most important reason that the war in Bosnia broke out. Not a very good example for a union that is supposed to create world peace. Read its preamble. Secondly, if you go to the refugee crisis, 2015, EU's 410 million people with a huge economy, the largest economic bloc in the world, could not find a way to accommodate a few refugees, about one, one and a half million refugees coming. By the way, coming from the wars in the countries we have ravaged. Wouldn't it have been reasonable to say, at least we take care for a short period until they can go back. We take care of the victims of our policies. No, 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 we pay Turkey to take it over. And there we are with Turkey. And we kept Serbia out. We did all these things. That should never have been done. And you had Brexit, which may end up being a good thing for England. I'm not so sure it's black and white. Given that you have to begin to where the United States and the European Union will be in 10, 20 years from now. And then last which I think is indicating a, a breaking down of the European Union, not being able to do anything for brothers and sisters in Italy and Spain and elsewhere where needed and not being able to coordinate its policies, Denmark, one country after the other, just closing its borders, finding national nationalistic solutions to the corona, no coordination, no real and certainly no help to people in countries outside. That was China and Russia and Cuba, who stood up for the rest of humanity. And of course, therefore, are ridiculed or demonized. So I'm not thinking that the um, European Union has a great future. It could have had, but it was wrongly constructed from the beginning because it looked like an empire rather than if you'd constructed 
the European Union along the same lines as we operate in Scandinavia without a union, but taking beautifully each other's policies and situations and positions into consideration before we make a decision. That's a much more uh, interesting way of doing it, because the European Union means unity in uniformity instead of unity in, un um, in diversity. And anything that is not aiming at diversity and coexistence between different elements and cultures and the ways of thinking are doomed in the future. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think that the European Union will survive either. Also, and that's the last example of it, because it has not been able to devise an alternative policy to the United States when it comes to Iran. It has not been able to keep its promises in the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran. It has stopped dealing with Iran because it submissively accepted that the United States could, inf uh, could transfer punishments to those countries that dealt with, had trade and investments with Iran. And so I have myself tried to transfer a little sum when they had a natural catastrophe in Iran. You cannot even transfer five dollars from a European bank to Iran and to suffering people there. Now, the European Union, who cannot become an alternative to Mr. Trump, to President Trump's administration, is not a union that has a great future. This is a golden moment for the European Union to rise and say, we in the West can do something new that those in the West West cannot do anymore. And you may also say the European Union doesn't have a great future because if you do not have a common foreign policy, but you think you should have a common army, you're going for disaster. I tell you, there's no less word, no other word for it. There'll be disaster. If you don't have a unified policy, you shouldn't have a unified army. So, next question. Will the US or the West be able to resurrect instead of just falling and becoming, you know, a periphery of the future world, in the future world, will it be able to do something interesting? I think yes. The race is not run yet, but it won't be easy. You have to stop to be in denial about the change of the world. You have to stop demonizing and being conflictual and confrontational with everybody else. And ask yourself the question the West never asks itself. Why has it gone so badly for us? Why are we in such a crisis? How can the finest democracy with that constitution on earth end up having only two candidates for the next US presidential election, Biden and Trump? I mean, none of them will in any way be able to save America from itself. And I say it this way because the United States has no enemies. The reason it's falling is the boomeranging effects of its own policies over many years, including what happened on 9-11, but we are not supposed to talk about why 9-11 happened, only how it happened, or who did it, but not why. Why terrorism happened, or why the war on terrorism now creates per year about 30 times more deaths than the original terrorist problem did in 2000 and 2001. So, at this juncture of human history comes something called a COVID-19 or Corona and takes everybody by surprise, an invisible, but not unthinkable and not unpredicted challenge or threat. It comes and I would formulate it very simply, Sorry for all those who have fallen ill and died, but this is a great opportunity, a blessing to humanity, the best wake-up call we could get. Much better than the wake-up call called the nuclear war or a nuclear detonation. We are certainly in a much better situation to begin now to reflect on what did we do wrong vis-a-vis -vis the environment, vis-a-vis -vis other countries, vis-a-vis -vis humanity, and how can we learn 
to do it differently when it's over or as much over as it will be. Probably it won't be over completely at any point. How do we care more for each other? How do we live differently? How do we consume less? How do we love nature more than destroy her? Etc. etc. A great opportunity for creative thinking for those who are creative. And as I said in the beginning, there's only one thing that will not happen. And that is going back to the normal, normal before Corona. It's out of the question. There's only a necessary new normal ahead. There's no returning back to or going back to what was. That will be the end of the world. But not if we use this opportunity to think, speak and act differently. So, <clears throat> the most important thing, and I can't, of course, cover all these sectors here in a short speech. What I can do is to say, Perhaps the most important thing to learn from the corona is that everything we called security so far must go. There was no security for any human beings or population in the world when the corona struck. While there were tons of spare parts and everything soldiers and aircrafts need in the military sector, there were no storage of face masks, thermometers, protection gear, and far too little research, far too little preparedness. Every country in the world had a national military-based security politics. It didn't have a human security politics. It had no idea how to care for its own citizens. Denmark, for instance, where some of my audience is sitting today, has participated in wars around the world, whenever you know Washington calls, it's going there, and it can go anywhere in 24 hours, bombing, as it has done, for instance, in Iraq. But nobody had any preparations. The health authorities that have asked for new resources, small, small money compared with the military, got nothing. And the same applies to everywhere else. The United States does not have enough body bags to those who have now died in the United States. But it has invested, what was it, $70 billion in new nuclear weapons in the last year. And the world spends about $2,000 billion on arms that do, do not make us secure. How much could we do for a fraction of that to make good health for people all over the world, including water supply? cleaning up areas, etc., etc. And the link, of course, is obvious. The link is the fact that the military, the world's military, is what, if not the, then one of the absolutely largest destroyers of nature with a huge environmental footprint. Does anybody think we can continue that post-corona? No, we have to go to human, for human security. And then some of you may have read that human security was a concept that the United Nations came up with, the, the economist Amatia Sen and Madame Ugata, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 2000s. No, I'm sorry to say so. I'm happy to say so. That's not true because the first report, concept, ever use of the word human security was by me. In a research report, in a project on the peace researcher Johan Galtung's leadership at Oslo University. It was published in 1978. Now, from 1978 and onwards, in a number of books and publications, I have argued for human security. Human security meaning security that starts as the point of departure is human needs and human rights. 
and then build up to the global humanities needs and rights. And only a fraction of that has anything to do with the military. Most of what threatens us on this earth is not something you can meet with military means. You can invent enemies, and that's what they do all the time. There are no enemies, really. If you, we want to be friends, we can be friends. We will have conflicts. But we don't have to use violence. But if we want to have that, and that's part of the concept of human security, if somebody says, in the name of democracy, some people want their countries or regions to be defended by military means too, I say, yes, okay. We can't put everybody in prison who wants to carry some guns or something. Let us, therefore, have defensive defense. That is, weapons that can only be used on your own territory and with a limited destructive capacity. These things are much more easy to do and produce. They are cheaper, they are stronger. If somebody comes to your territory, it will be hell to try to control you. But your systems, your weapons, do not threaten somebody a thousand of kilometers away. It will only threaten that somebody if that somebody tries to sit on you, on your territory, or otherwise. Now, the whole idea of defensive thinking is compatible with nonviolence. Nonviolence means that I'm ready to suffer more than making others suffer. That's a very good thing and a noble thing to do. We have to promote this ethos or ethics of defensiveness and coexistence. Because you can't coexist between two countries or five countries or 193 countries where everybody is potentially a threat and everybody sees others as threats to them. We have to have a system in which we learn to solve conflict and only as a last resort do we use violence. And that violence, again, according to the UN Charter, shall be commanded by the UN or whatever organization we set up to do so. Not by the United States or NATO or somebody else. It's a complete fake way of interpreting the international law and international structure organization that the United Nations stand for. So we got to end all the discussions about armament and new armament and money for the armament, for, for the arms and for the military authorities and all that. They do only harm. One, because they use the resources that could go to better uh, purposes and goals and create a much better benign welfare humanity. And because they have not delivered it's not only NATO, it's all the others who have not delivered. There's no peace that you can, you can say is a consequence of all these military investments done over the last five, six, seven decades. It must go. I'm not saying all military must go, but militarism must go, as I said, like slavery, cannibalism, absolute monarchy, and the other things we have decided to abolish because we are human beings and civilized. And civilization definitely should not accept nuclear weapons. So, point four, post-corona. I've already kind of gone into it, but post-corona. What will that society look like? I have to go through it quickly. I can see that time is running a little bit away from me. I don't know why. Um, I think we need to see governments made accountable for that security politics. That means basically elections everywhere post-corona. And only governments which agree to change fundamentally everything they have called security politics in the direction of human security should be elected or re-elected. It should be punished for not having cared for their own people. This corona crisis is a security policy crisis. The corona crisis is a security policy crisis. It documents the utter failure of how governments arrogantly have squeezed out taxpayers' money, not paid it back in terms of security for those people, their citizens but only the security for those who run the militarist 
cultural societies or pockets, namely the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC. Epsilon 1, I'll repeat it, the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC. Tiny elites in all countries, basically, who are more loyal with themselves, politicians, industrialists, media people, experts, etc. More loyal with themselves and each other than with their own people. What are you if you haven't got face masks stored? but you can go out and bomb on the order of somebody else in a military alliance. You have abandoned your responsibility and don't use the word security for that type of thing. It's a global scandal. So far, few see it. If you who listen and see this could do something about it, actualize the idea that the corona crisis is a security policy crisis. And it must change everything we call security up till today. This has been a very useful moment for all of us, if you can do it. So we change the thinking in the post-corona world. We make peace first. And then we secure it with a security and defense policy. Not the other way around, because peace never comes with the security policies we've had so far. Protection even doesn't come. And this means... A large part of that will be, and now I'm back to the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. If you build structures where you cooperate with each other, where you buy into each other's projects, where you get human encounters, where you have fast transport and communication, where you do that according to a kind of win-win, I'm not saying 50-50, very few projects can be exactly, you know, both parties winning equally much. But at least no lose, no win-lose, but win-win to a certain extent. Then you make it less likely that there will be war. It's so banal that I'm ashamed to say it. But if we cooperate and get to know each other and have some benefits from what we do together, there's less a chance that we will begin to kill each other. May the world learn such simple things shouldn't be impossible to recognize this. And everyone can do it. You can reach out to anyone and say, let's cooperate, or at least decide not to kill each other. The moment we know somebody in international, we're friends in different countries, etc. It means something different to us if somebody says, let's go and bomb that country. No, sorry, don't bomb my friends. And the same applies to people and countries whose economy is educational system, cultural exchanges, etc., are going together in a way we say, for Christ's sake, don't destroy this. Let's find a solution. We don't want to destroy what we have built together. It's so banal, but it's a very important piece of philosophy. So, finally about this. We're going through a huge economic crisis. It'll take a long time before we get a new economy and we get back forward, from back to forward, with a new type of economic extraction of resources, production, consumption, and ways of dealing with the waste. We need a completely new economic system. An economy as a science will not be the best place to start with that. It's not even a science, I would say, but that's a long story. It takes all capacities, all backgrounds, all intelligences, all cultures and all ages to have global discussions about what should the productive system look like that has limited qualities, but a steady state, sustainable growth in partnership with nature, not with only ourselves in what is called an anthropocentric way of thinking, meaning that human beings should do whatever they want and exploit everything for their own benefit. Human beings is just one living kind of creature on Earth. And that leads us to a long story, which I won't go into, but that is the global ethics. We can't do with a Christian, you know, neighborhood ethics. Don't do this and don't do that to the neighbor. Act in such a way that you do not harm the world. And if everybody else do what you do, the world will still be there. 
Don't do something that only you can do. And that if others did the same, the world would disappear or be damaged or destroyed. Global ethics is about thinking, can I do this? Because if everybody else cannot also do it, I should abstain from doing it. And secondly, global ethics is about the future. Taking those into account who are not born yet, the yet non-born, the yet unborn, what are the needs of the children who are not yet born? Because we cannot live and survive with a perspective that is four years to the next election. What a ridiculous idea. It's even irresponsible. All these kinds of ways of thinking that we took for granted before must change in the post-corona transition stage. And that's why it's so terribly fascinating. We have all the possibilities now to create a better world if we get our acts together. All this will cost money. All this will cost resources. And what we do simply is take the money from the military budgets, transfer them, convert them to civilianly useful things for humanity. It'll cost enormous sums, tremendous sums, beautiful sums to speak with Trump. And he will not be part of it. But the United States should be part of it. But I don't know who can lead that in the United States. A new thinking where you're not exceptional, but one of ours together with the rest of the world. Point five and last. Can we do it? Isn't this too much to ask? Isn't this too idealistic? I believe in positive energy. Let me give you a story. I had the great privilege 30 years ago to have long conversations with the first and biggest dissident in Eastern Europe, Milo Vangelas, in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade, in this little dark flat. Old man, white hair, greatest inspirations of his were Lenin and Gandhi. Somebody who can, you know, have those in, inside their thinking, quite interesting intellectuals. And he once used this formulation about the partisan struggle against Nazism and fascism and the Chetniks. That had we known that what we did was impossible, we would never have succeeded. I always come back to those conversations 30 years ago in these moments. We don't know that it's impossible to save the world and make it a better place. And therefore we should try. It may be impossible, but if we work on it and don't say that it's impossible, then we may succeed. Great inspiration, that means to live in a utopia. But not an unrealistic utopia, but a, 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 a utopia, sorry, this is difficult. Utopia that is an utopia, not a dystopia. That's a, thing, a place we don't want to go. But an utopia is a place we want to go, which is also possible, whereas a utopia is a place we never reach. So we should go for utopia, but not utopia, but utopia. And I'm back to what I firmly believe, also for having worked throughout my life in war zones. There is much more goodness, cooperation, decency, respect, humanity in the world than there is evil. Evil is just a bad excuse for using your own violence against somebody you call evil. There is so much more positive energy in the world if it could be let out, if we could use it, if we could utilize it. Problem is, there's too little research on goodness. That's virtually nothing. There is too little media coverage of when something good happens. We only have the bad stories that repress all of us. And there is too little political and social dialogue about goodness. Everything in this world is about critique, negative views, reports of how the world is going to hell and all that. It's unbearable in the long run. People are so focused on everything that is negative instead of looking at, hey, if I had all the powers in the world, how would I do it? You know, we have a peace movement. I'm sorry to say it's an anti-movement, anti-militarism, anti-US movement, anti-NATO, anti-weapons. It has very little interesting to say if you ask them, what is peace to you and how would you bring it about? What's your strategy and politics for creating a peaceful world? If we don't have that, 
I think we have reason to pism for being pessimists. But I refuse to be there. I think vision, utopias, asking yourself how could it be, is actually giving you energy. And I hope I can convey some of that energy and perspective to some of you here because people in power want you to feel that you should give up and there's nothing you can do and little old me have no chance of influencing the world. That's the worst power those in power have over us. And I refuse to be part of it, like a few other people have done in the world. We have much too much negative approaches, much too much negative energy. We need the positive vision. We need, need this feeling that yes, we can do it. Yes, we can get together. Yes, we can link up with others. And don't get into small detail. Find out where you have something together in the grosso modo part of the world. And you will find out that you have friends and you have like-minded people on the other side of the globe. A year ago, I traveled six weeks through China on my own, completely without any planning or anything. I met tons of people, lovely cooperative people, people with hospitality, people who thought the same things that, that I thought, that, that everybody thinks in the world. And we found out that across cultures we can cooperate and we can create something better. But we are prevented all the time from this negative thinking, this destructive thinking. Remember that the last speech Martin Luther King gave probably knowing that he would be killed, was, I have seen the promised land. And I may not go there myself, but you might. And you know, this is the whole thing. What is your promised land? What is your beloved community, to speak Luther King again? What is it you want to see? Because if you don't see it, you won't work for it. If you begin to see it and have seminars about it, Write about it yourself. Reflect on it every day. What is the world I would like to see? And it might happen. But it doesn't happen if you don't think of the constructive new world ahead of us. That could come. So, I think I am there now where it's time to say thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to any questions, comments, and criticism, but also better ideas, concrete ideas, after these, this uh, lecture. And you may say I'm too optimistic, I'm a dreamer. What's wrong with dreaming? I think it's much better than nightmares. And we have enough nightmares. So I would say, <clears throat> you probably ask now before I leave, but what are we going to do with all the bad people, the militarists and those who kill other people and all that? You see, I would say, try to love them, try to have dialogues with them and try to help them peace off. So, thank you. Stay safe and stay hopeful. There are many reasons to. Thank you so much. <laughs>